Okay, guys. Uh, my name's Nathan Askew. I'd like to welcome everybody to the to the second official Zoom Safari. I'm going to work through a little introduction here, and and then we'll we'll get right into it. Um, thanks for everybody. Uh, thanks to everybody for for attending. Of course, um, this uh, the the purpose of these meeting is meetings is to get out as much good information about hunting, namely hunting Africa, as we can. Uh, I've been a professional hunter in Africa for 17, 18 years now, and uh, and these meetings are about getting people interested in Africa, and I try to answer these questions as best I can, and, and y'all's participation is, uh, it's appreciated. The We all know that hunters are the best conservationists, and especially in Africa, your dollars as as hunters that are actively traveling and visiting African countries, it protects more habitat than any other sect of people, any other government organization. Hunters' dollars protect more habitat than anything else. So we appreciate it. And, and then, uh, yeah, let's have some fun. And uh, I'll go over kind of what the idea of this meeting is. Um, this one's going to be anything Africa. Now, by y'all can ask me anything you want. Um, I may or may not answer it or it may or may not be the right answer, but, but I'll give it a stab. So anything Africa, and we're going to limit uh, my answers. I'll address a person and, and please ask the question and take as long as you like doing that. And then I'm going to limit my answer to one minute. Uh, we've en enlisted uh, Mr. Mark Whitley to be the official referee. He supposedly has a stopwatch and he's going to keep me from rambling on like I'm doing right now. So the idea is to get through as many questions as we can and, 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 and keep this thing rolling. So, um, all right, that's the time limit. Um, the mistakes I made on the last one, of course, I'm sorry, I, I posted the third video first on the Dangerous Game Zoom. I have now corrected that. And then you guys, uh, uh, please feel free as much as you're able to, to post on those individual threads to keep them keep people interested in attending the next one. Uh, I really appreciate that. And then I appreciate the new people here and in, in the old guys that came back. So, um, all right. So we'll just get right into it. Uh, Mr. Austin, you're yep. the first to log in and, and the, the honor goes to you. You can tee off. Okay. So it's, it's really interesting that your first uh, point a minute ago was about your hunters coming, the family of four and, you got two leopards uh, uh, for those folks. In Tanzania, leopard, is that on a 21-day or 14-day license? That is on a 21-day license. Okay. Um, so the license situation in Tanzania, I'll elaborate on that. They changed the regulation last year, and there were some minor changes. They went from a 7 10, 14, 21, 28 day choices to uh, major, uh, minor, major, and premium. Now, I don't know why they did that. Apparently, they were trying to give us some benefit or it was some something good for the client. Really, even though there is a number of days on a license, the quota is decided by the outfitter. Now, there will be a legal, you'll have the legal permission to hunt an animal, but I can get you the biggest license, 21 day or which now is a premium license, and I could only allow you to hunt buffalo and plains game because that would be our deal. I could have sold you a three buffalo and plains game, common plains game, you know, no sable, no roan, no leopard, no lion, and that's me managing my quota to get the most well, to, to satisfy the client and also get the most out of out of the business arrangement and and the most out of the area to 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 suit all the different needs. So that was probably over a minute. Yeah, it was it was a little over, but I was thinking because there's a little bit smaller group. If you want to make it a little bit longer, <laughs> well, you went over by a little, but I wasn't going to stop you just yet. All right. No, I appreciate it. Uh, but I mean, you got to throw me a red flag if you want. I mean, I don't mind. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, Mr. Austin. So uh, follow that up for me. That kind of, 
I tried to nutshell that as best I could. Yeah, so in, in your particular area, if a, if a guy wants to get a leopard, that has to come under the 21-day premium uh, license. But you could have the guy come in and hunt 14 days, uh, but he still has to have the premium license from Tanzania, right? That is correct. That is correct. Uh, in order, the first step is the legal hunting of the species. So for a leopard, you have to be on the premium license, the bigger license. Um, now, I have had, uh, three years ago, I had a client come in and he hunted for two days, shot his leopard the second morning and flew out. He paid the same license cost that I would have sold a 21 day leopard hunter at, right? I mean, so I make some exceptions every now and then if a guy tells me, well, we had a gentleman on here last time that had been on five trips for leopard, whatever, just to, just to, you know, if I got a guy like that, I'll give him some security. I'll, I'll give him a, I'll give him a 21 day hunt for, for leopard. But I know that we're going to get the leopard. Well, I'm pretty sure we'll get a leopard in, in 14 days. Cause, cause that's just what we do. But the, uh. The, if I had to sell that, oh, time, time, no more sales pitch. All right, back to back to Mr. Austin, and then we'll open it up for the floor. No, I'll, I'll just open it up to everybody else. Go to, the, go to the next guy. We only got six people, so we'll come back around. Oh, yeah. If, uh, does anybody else want to ask? Uh, uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, you know, Mr. Austin's question about licenses in Tanzania, a lot of people, they rightfully want to know where their money's going and why and for what. And, and every country's different and every country's very complicated. And, and I have a habit of telling the truth uh, about the whole thing, right? So we gotta be legal. Then I gotta protect my area and get the client what he wants. And then I've gotta make a living to stay in business. So it's, that's the way it is. Does anybody else have a follow-up question on that, on that Tanzania license stuff? That's a, always a hot topic. Yeah, so if if a guy says I want to hunt a leopard, but I only got ten days, you he still is on that twenty one day license. He's just only he's only there for the ten, so it doesn't. That's right. Not committed to it. It just allows the different animals, right? That's correct. That's correct. Um, what what that does, um, and I have people that that do that. They they say, listen. Uh, I want to do this hunt. Your brochure says 21 days or 14 days. And uh, I can only be there for 10 days. Uh, I charge him the same thing I would charge my regular 14 day hunter. Now, why do I do that? We, we've already covered that he has to have the same license, right? I mean, but the daily rate, I'm not going to give him a break on the daily rate for that reason alone, because my area, you know, we operate several areas and th that area has four leopard, let's say. I need to have X amount for each of those leopards or else, or else it, doesn't, it doesn't work out. So he can hunt two days, 12 days. It's going to be the cost of the 14-day safari. Then when I add days, uh, when I add days on, I, I cut a deal depending on what the client wants or what the, you know, if he wants to add a couple of days, I typically it's less than the original days. But then if he beat me up over a lot of other stuff, like you got to give me my charter flight and you got to give me this and you got to, well, well then, then no, we got to pay full price for the extra days. <laughs> All right. Um, well, let's move on to Mr. Adam, Mr. Adam. Welcome, sir. Well, thank you, Nathan. Uh, again, thank you for hosting us. Uh, I'm a total newbie with, safari i've never been on one and i'm still a few years out from going on one uh i've been talking with some friends that have gone and just trying to start compiling information to be better prepared so i've been working out through lists of things and one of the first questions comes up um just kind of curiosity what sort of stuff you see clients bring that when they as soon as they pull it out you start rolling your eyes why the hell did you bring that <laughs> All right. great question that's a yeah, good wonderful one. question. <laughs> I, I, I like it. I like it. Now, 
Uh, uh, Whitley, don't start the clock. Give me one I'm second not, to I'm think about it. I'm going to extra time on this one. I mean, because <laughs> I've seen people pull some weird shit out of bags, right? I mean, we gotta, I got to think about this for a second. Um, I, think, I think everybody can probably agree on the first one. You, you overpack, right? Oh, oh yeah. It's oh, terrible. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, Adam, that's a good question. The first thing is I'm going to be polite, and you will not see me roll my eyes. That That's the first thing. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you've got to be professional about it. But, you know, when – when they're not looking, you know, that's, you see the backside right. of your brain, you know. But the, the, the funniest thing is when the trackers ask me about why, why you brought something. That, 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 then it gets real humorous. But um, now the, the, you, the, the biggest thing is you probably do overpack. Really, I, I don't like to see a person show up with three pair of shorts, right? Mainly because – I don't think you should wear shorts in Africa because there's many things that'll scratch and bite you. But if you do wear shorts, bring two pair of shorts, two pair of pants because there's daily laundry. You know, the most you're gonna go without laundry is during your travel period. So on most safaris, you're way better off. Instead of bringing your five favorite pair of blue jeans, bring two pair of blue jeans, right? Um, so, but, your your baggage space is better spent on on varying items like a light jacket, a sweater with a hood, t-shirts, long sleeve hunting shirts. So you have a variety of stuff. Africa's colder than most people think, and I've had a lot of I've had a lot of people get cold on spark. Um, I'm trying to think of something funny that somebody's pulled out that I just really had to shake my head on, and it's such a great opportunity to to tell a funny story and I'm going to lose it. Um, the, uh, you don't, um, man, you know, we hey, have Nathan, a, Nathan, this is Matt. Can I get, can I cue you on some stuff that might trip some? some oh yeah. There? Yeah. Go, go, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. You know, if you, if you go down a list of the stuff people say to pack, right, there are varying opinions on like whether or not you should bring a, like a knife, either a pocket knife or, you know, some giant Bowie thing or whatever. They're, you know, fire starters, GPSs, you know, all this kind of stuff that like if I was headed into the hills here, I'd have my kind of 10 essentials type stuff, an emergency blanket, you know, this kind of stuff stuffed in the bottom of my pack. So do you view all that kind of thing as extraneous? I mean, right down to a med kit with a tourniquet and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's good. Uh, basically the, you really have to worry about yourself, meaning that bring things that make you comfortable. Don't, well, first of all, this is provided you've booked with a prepared and professional person. Adam, do you just, there's a lot of great outfitters out there and, and do research and find the outfitter that has what you want to hunt and then make sure you've got the, the, the right man that's, that's gonna tell you what to bring. But the, like a knife, yes, you want a knife, but you want a knife like this. Uh, you, you want a knife that size. You don't, because the, probably what you're gonna do with this knife is cut an apple to eat it or a piece of biltong. If you try to take your knife to your trophy in my skin and shed, uh, my trackers and skinners will have a heart attack and somebody may tackle you. I mean, like they, they're not, you, they don't want you to skin it. That they, they don't, they don't need the help. Um, now on dangerous game hunts, I carry a sheath knife because just in case something gets wild, but uh, on a plains game hunt, you don't need a sheath knife. In my opinion, you need a, a little folding pocket knife. Now a uh, first aid kit, you, you more need your medication and things that you're prone to. If you're prone Maybe, you know, some people are bad about migraines. Bring your medicine, right? Don't rely on me for Tylenol, although I have Tylenol. Um, if you're bad to get blisters, have extra mole skin for your feet or something. So once again, it's back to your individual stuff. Spend your packing time and your packing space on things that'll help you. GPS, I recommend it because that's a safety item and it's fun for you to get back home and see where you've been you should not need a GPS. I have a GPS, my trackers have a GPS, and my driver has a GPS. But if mine goes down 
and the tracker forgot to put batteries in his, which can happen, then, then, then maybe we need yours. Um, first aid kit and tourniquets and things like that, we have all that standby. If you have extra space, then things like, uh, you know, a tourniquet isn't a bad idea. A, uh, one of those emergency blankets is never a bad idea. Um, and then a lot of outfitters, they really appreciate it when you leave stuff like that over there. Emergency blanket in the state, five bucks. In Africa, hard to come by. So, uh, you know, that, that's kind of the thing. So uh, I'll throw it back to you, Adam. Give me a follow-up on that. What else you got on packing? Uh, so uh, to follow up, so what's the most common thing somebody forgets to bring? Where they come in and go, oh, you know, I meant to bring it and it's not here or man, it's something really necessary that they really didn't pack. Okay. Uh, good question. I, I'd say I see people forget their sling a lot. Right, they take their gun apart and they forget their sling. I think I had a guy forget his bolt one time, which was a that that didn't work very well. Right, he took the bolt out to pack it. Some is a that was a system failure there. That was bad. Um, the the but the sling. Now I do not like a sling myself, but a client I actually like them to have a sling. It takes a little pressure off your hands. Um, the in case somebody falls down they don't get hurt it's bad um it the main thing is it keeps your gun barrel pointed north which to me north is always straight up so it keeps your gun barrel going straight up in the air which is away from the back of my head which i appreciate very much clients carrying their gun like this scares the absolute shit out of me i had a uh, employ I had a PH that worked for me get shot by a client because of that. Uh, and, and actually, I know several PHs that have been shot by their clients. So a sling is good. Now, I, for that reason, I carry extra slings in my kit. But I see that. Mainly it's if they, they were real prepared and ready to go, and then they take something off their gun, or they take something out of their backpack to do one less time at the range, and they forget their – rangefinder, binoculars, whatever. Um, but yeah, sling and then uh, other than that, it'd just be across the board, you know? It'd be across the board as far as forgetting stuff. It's time, but I think I think Nathan had a, didn't you have a video about packing, didn't you? I did a video, I did do was a video that about you, packing. Was yep. that you pack or what the client should pack? So I, that was about my pack. That was my backpack. And, and my backpack is very different from a client. So it, in fact, one of the next zoom meetings was going to be my pack, your pack, meaning mm. this is what I have in my everyday rucksack. This is what I want a client to have in his everyday rucksack. rucksack. Um, you should have a backpack carry on item helps you through the airports. It helps keep all your documents and your cash, valuables, binoculars, medication, uh, electronics. Everybody should travel with a backpack. Um, and then that backpack is going to be with you every day on the vehicle. And you'll bring it to your room every night, and you'll put it back on the vehicle every day. It'll have your ammunition, your iPhone, your books, your, your whatever, right? Um, so... My backpack is very different than, than, than the client's, than the hunter's backpack. Um, but I did do a video on that where I pulled out some tourniquets and medication and everything from tweezers to, to radiator, you know, hose tape and stuff like that. It was, I thought that was a decent, I, yeah, I had some, a lot of weird, weird little things in there. But anyway, uh, Adam, what else you got for me? Uh, is that, is that, we're going to make it back to you. We don't have. Uh, we'll make it back to you. Is that pretty much uh, get what you needed? Uh, that kind of covers that. Uh, just uh, follow up on one thing you mentioned. Um, you said something about a rangefinder. Do you recommend clients to bring a rangefinder with, or is that something you can't have? Or yep, I I have it. Uh, I have it with, and most PHs do. You can bring a rangefinder if it's a small one. Uh, to me, it's wasted space for most clients. Are with most outfits, most PHs now, most experienced PHs, 
they have a system that works and they know the ranges. How do they know the ranges? They know the size of the animal. They know the terrain they're hunting and the hunt, the client does not know that. So in South Africa, I know a steam buck is under 200 yards because I know what the rocks look like on that, on that plane. And I know what, how big a steam buck is. And I just know. So in that case, a client pulling out his range finder, that's not good. I don't want you to do that because that little bugger is going to run away, right? We're wasting time here. I need right. you looking through your scope and listening for instruction. Uh, I'd put up the sticks and I'd get you on it. Then I would assess the trophy. I know you're shooting a 270. I know you shot an inch high at 100 yards because I'm paying attention from the time you showed up, right? I should be. I'm going to tell you to aim right at the middle of that animal behind the shoulder because at 190 yards, that's the most margin for air on any wiggle on your side. And that is where I want you to hit a steam buck. And if you hold the crosshair there, that bullet will hit just below the middle of the body at 190 yards if you're zero at 100 or one inch high at 100. So it, a range finder is good, but it's not – uh, there's always one on our trucks and I'd say, uh, I'd say eight out of 10 pHs have it. So ask your individual pH on that. But, uh, to me, it's kind of wasted space. Yeah. Hey, Adam. Yeah. There, there's something that, that, that he said there, right? When he, when he puts the sticks up, he wants you on your rifle. I've, I've been to Africa twice, not a lot, but as a general rule, my pH preferred that I did not use my binoculars, that I, when he set the sticks up, he wanted me on the rifle, not glassing. Yeah. Saying, wow, there's a nice one. Now, if we were looking at a field or something, or he wants me to look one way and he'll look another, that's fine. But the, the honest, the, if you didn't bring binoculars, it wouldn't be a terrible thing. Well, and a lot of the stuff I've read uh, has always said for the client, you know, bring something lower power like eight power binoculars. You don't need some big honking binocular because it's not your job to be the one that goes out there and finds everything. That's why you have a pH. So, you know. Well, and, and, and I will say this, if, you know, I have a lot of hunting experience here in the States, but none in Africa. I can't judge hardly anything. The pHs will give you a tip, but I couldn't tell you what, when, when I throw into Africa, all the kudu looks huge. <laughs> and he great, he goes, My God, it's a monster. And he's like, no, that's a juvenile. You can't shoot that. And you're like, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? I came here to shoot, man. Why can't I shoot this thing? Um, right. Well, you laugh because you understand, right? Because <laughs> you as the hunter, have, I don't have the ability to say what's a good impala I can say that one looks really big compared to the other ones. That's about it, you know. So, yep. it, it, my fondest memory of the first safari I ever went on, Adam, was a PH and I standing on the back of a truck, leaning over the cab, both of us with binoculars, looking at kudu way in the distance. And I'm getting all excited, thinking, like Art's talking about, this is a great animal. And he just puts his binoculars down after about 15 seconds and says, nah, we can do better than that. Drive on. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Wait a minute. That's this big animal standing over here. No, drive on. He's not good enough. <laughs> yeah. You just can't. Yeah. Now, to, to, to follow that up, bring a pair of binoculars. And even though they you own them, don't. If the sticks are up, don't touch them. Even though they're yours, you'll yeah. make the pH a little irritated if you're doing this instead of doing this. But anyway, yeah. um, all right, good deal. I have some binoculars I was going to go over when we got to some equipment, and, and that's that's good. I think, uh, you know, th th that's th th that, that was good. I like that. The converse, the, you know, you need to be handy with your gun, handy with your bullets, make yourself comfortable, right? The rest. The, the rest is you're there to be to be guided and, and, and helped out. All right. Well, good deal. Uh, thank you.
Adam, we'll, we'll get back to you on another one. Uh, Mr. Drew, fire yes. away. Fire okay. away. What you got? Okay. Um, my question, I, and, and it was Adam had a good one uh, there, and, and I guess I would add to that uh, binoculars thing is one thing about binoculars is uh, one of the nice things about hunting in Africa is uh, the stuff that you shoot is not the only thing to look at. Um, uh, you know, I'm half the time I'm looking at uh, all the different birds and iguanas and everything else that you happen to happen to see. So you definitely want uh, your binoculars because hunting's part of it, but the other stuff you see is is part of the experience. And you definitely want binoculars for that. So, um, but my my question and and it's uh, I did a little bit of guiding when I was in my twenties, and um, is uh, when I was guiding the, the people obsessed about their firearms and, and their knives and this, that, and the other thing. But the thing that ruined more hunts than anything was their choice of footwear and what they wore on their feet. And uh, so I'd like to know about what you recommend is, uh, um, you know, choosing uh, proper footwear for, um, for hunting in Africa um, and, and a little bit maybe beyond what the normal, you know, make sure they're broken in, make sure they're comfortable, that type of thing. What features would you say you would look at for something you'd wear on a, you know, spot and stock African hunt? Gotcha. Gotcha. Good, good question. Um, so, uh, Mr. Official, I'm going to request, I'm going to request a, a two minute time limit on this because I have visual aids. I'd like to introduce some visual aids into this, into this question. Yeah, granted. Okay. <laughs> All right, perfect. Um, so, footwear, the, the, the basics, right? I, I, won't, I mean, the basics are what we all know. Don't show up with, a, with laces in one hand and boots in another. That means they're not broken in. That's, that's the worst thing. Um, I had a client bring cowboy boots on an elephant hunt one time, and, and you know, he'd worn them his whole life because he was from Texas. We ended up having to borrow the tracker shoes, cut the toes off, and duct tape a new front on the shoe after the third day because his feet were swelled up this big. So you you want broken boots. You want them to be all – I like all leather constructed, meaning a lot of the modern-day, quote-unquote, hunting or hiking boot, the lightweight ones have mesh. Mesh collects uh, a lot of little seeds and crap that's hard to get out and can irritate your foot. Um, as long as, you know, you have the right socks, I like a mostly leather constructed because it protects your foot and it keeps things out. I like a, uh, an, ankle, an ankle size thing for, for foot support. I think that's very important. One of the biggest injuries we probably see is a rolled ankle. Uh, so if you're bad, uh, if you're not as fit as you used to be or, or you, you have bad ankles, that, that ankle support is important. And I have two examples of, of boots that I personally like. The other thing I've noticed is a, a lot of these new boots have very, very hard soles, hard and very loud soles. This, that Vibram sole is great. Maybe it lasts a, maybe it lasts 50 years, it'll outlast the leather, but it, they're very, very loud. So I like kind of a softer rubber sole because, well, because it's quieter, I guess. Um, does that make a big difference? I don't know, it, you know. It, two um, minutes. Two minutes, shit, okay, no, I need a minute extension. I need a minute extension. Um, I'm gonna pull out, I'm gonna pull out my, the two boots. So my experience with boots have been Danner. Well, I've, I've had everything, Merrill's, Danners, uh, uh, Russell Moccasins, Courtney's, and I'll tell you, I'll show you my two favorite here. Just hold tight. All right. This is what I would go with, guys. So, example number one. Can everybody hear me? Give me a thumbs up. We're good. Okay. Example number one, this is a pair of Danners. My feet do not sweat a lot. 
Um, I don't have a problem with that. These are uninsulated danners. They have a very hard sole. I don't like that. They have great ankle support, and these boots are bulletproof, and you can take anywhere, and they are very, very, very comfortable. I love them. They fit my foot. They're, they're, I think these are about four or 500 bucks, and you, you just can't break the damn things. Um, these are Kinetrek. I think I called these Danners a second ago. These are Kinetrek. Um, they're tougher than anything else I've seen. Um, for some people, this will be overkill, right? This will be a little too much boot, but they're not as heavy as they look. Um, they don't have the sole sewn in, but still, these things are bulletproof and tough, great ankle support. Nothing can get inside of there to, to mess your hunt up as far as messing up stuff in your boot. The second pair is this right here. This is a Courtney boot. That's $500. People that have hunted a lot in Africa, they know about these. Uh, basically, you got tire tread soles. They're a little bit hard, but they're good, right? They're durable. The main thing is they are sewn. They're sewn together. So you don't have all this glue and stuff coming apart like you have on a pair of Merrells or High Techs or insert the name, Bass Pro Shop. Any boot nowadays is pretty much junk. Uh, and, and, and they will not last me more than one season. I, walk, I, I ruin any pair of boot that I have except for these. Oh, that's the other one. Except for this and this are the only ones that'll make it through. These are comfortable, all leather constructed. They're sealed up to keep grass out. Um, it's a very simple boot. It's very durable. I like it. I have had Russell moccasins. I had to send my Russell moccasins. I had to send my Russell moccasins back to them twice. I sent the same pair of boots back twice, and uh, and they re-glued them for me, which was which was nice. They didn't charge me. The the people that own it are good people. But those Russell moccasins, they they're comfortable. They have almost no cushion on the bottom of your foot, um, but they are the quietest hunting boot I have ever, ever had. That's my, that's my, uh, it, it, my, my hat's off to them. It's very quiet, very comfortable. It fits like a, like a good leather glove, but they just didn't hold up. I found myself at night having to glue my shoes back together the first season I had them. So, that's my take on boots. Uh, anybody else want to throw something out there? I mean, feet are like people. There's all kinds of different, but but those, that Kinetrack and these Courtney's and Russell's would be third place. Uh, so, Nathan, you, you hit on the, the major point that anybody that's going to go hunt and walk is that whatever you take, it be something that you've already broken in. So, in, in my case, uh, I've got a real expensive pair of Mindy German made boots. Uh, they're great. I like them. They're heavy as hell. Uh, so when I was getting ready for the elephant hunt, I was walking between five and seven miles a day, every day for three months, getting ready for that hunt. And I broke in a pair of echo walkers like mocks. And that's and they had good soles. They were quiet, uh, and they were already broke in. And that's that's what I did the elephant hunt in, and they worked out fine because thorns would not penetrate the bottoms. Whereas my son was wearing a pair of boots, and one of those big damn thorns went right through it. Uh, yeah. So that's the other consideration: is that boot or whatever you're wearing be able to protect the bottom of your foot? You talking about moccasins? My little tender feet, I couldn't, I couldn't do it, a moccasin, because I'd step on a rock and you'd be carrying me back to the truck. Yeah, it, those Russell moccasins are very, very thin, and yeah. and, and that wouldn't be for everybody. I, I, I liked them, but I liked them. They just weren't durable enough. Uh, Drew, what, what, what kind of boots are you – I mean, also it matches the hunt, like uh, Mr. Austin was saying, but what kind of boots, what kind of boots you have or what kind of boots you're looking at, at getting? 
Well, I, I've, I've been to Africa three times, twice to Namibia and once to uh, South Africa. And uh, the South African um, hunt um, was quite hilly and I ended up wearing um, an old pair of uh, keen hikers and uh, they were quite good. Um, and, uh, and then the other, other hunts, I actually wore uh, a pair of, um, I think they were just sort of Clark's um, uh, you know, chukka boots and they had flat soles. And the first time I went, they were really good. I went in August. Um, but the second time I went, I went earlier in the season and there was more of those, uh, of the grass you were talking about and the seeds in that grass, um, could get through any, any little stitch hole in the, in the boot. So they were, they are actually, um, uh, in the course of a day, they were making their way through just the stitches. Of, they were like a moccasin style. And they would get through the holes in the stitching, um, which I, I, I didn't even know really there looked like there was a hole there. But by the end of the day, I had to spend it, uh, spend it you know, picking the, the seeds out. So um, the same boot, different, you know, different season didn't work out. So... And then my, my next, you know, hunts are, you know, I'm planning on doing maybe a buffalo hunt in the next three years, um, you know, possibly in Mozambique or Tanzania or wherever I happen to happen to go. Um, and so I'd like to, I'd like to make sure that my hunt's not uh, impacted negatively by my choice of footwear. Gotcha. Gotcha. So um, that's, that's what I like about both of the boots that I showed there. There is there, there, a grass seed can't get into this. Only it can come in from the top. I don't like to wear gaiters. Uh, the, the gaiter, if anybody doesn't know, is a piece of leather or canvas that surrounds your foot. Usually people, well, knock my ear thing out. Usually people that, uh, usually PHs that wear shorts. Once again, I've touched on that. I can't figure that I can't figure that out. Um, people that wear shorts like those gaiters because obviously, you know, things will get in the top of the boot. I make sure my pants are long enough to really go down and sit nicely on top of my boot. That's very important, right? That's important for another reason, not only grass seeds. In big game areas, there's a thing called a tetsy fly. And if you hunt with me, you're going to get to know them and you're going to hate them. Well, I mean, they're, they're an amazing insect, but they bite a lot. And if you get one up your pants, they can bite you in some places you don't want to be bit. They will migrate north again. So the that having your pants that come down nicely and all the way over your boot, very, very important. Now, to hit on another point, you mentioned Mozambique. I have a lot of experience in Mozambique hunting the swamp areas as well as the Zambezi Delta, uh, you know, the, the Zambezi River areas, the, you know, the hills on Zimbabwe side or Mozambique side, whatever, same kind of terrain. Um, if you go to Mozambique and you go to do a swamp hunt, very affordable, average size buffalo, big adventure, fun hunt, um, your feet are going to get wet your feet will get wet. In fact, your pants may, your underwear may get wet. You may be wet every single day. If that's the case, in those areas, I always used, I don't even know what they're called. They almost, they're a canvas. They got a rubber bottom, a little rubber toe cap, and they're canvas three-quarter lace-ups. And, and, uh, and I use those because they dried out. They, they would dry out every uh that they would dry it, you know, they, they would dry out every night and I would have dry feet for the first 30 minutes of the morning until we stepped off into a damn swamp again. Right. I mean, that's how that went. Um, so anyway, that's footwear. Uh, what, uh, what, anybody else got something else to add about, about the, the foot, footwear is a very important thing. I mean, as far as having the right piece of equipment, I'm not so sure that the right pair of boots isn't ahead of, a fancy rifle. I know it's ahead of a fancy rifle. Um, a good pair of boots is very, very important. And I recommend people bring their main hunting boots, a pair of tennis shoes, 
and then flip flops if you're a flip flop kind of person. Reason is give your hunting boots time to air out and dry out in your tent while you come to the fire and we have a, a drink and dinner and all that. Let your hunting boots air out. Um, so bring you a pair of comfortable tennis shoes and or lounge shoes to wear at dinner. I mean, we have a three course dinner in Tanzania every single night, whether, whether I tell the chef not to or, or, or it doesn't matter. We're having it every night and you can wear your sweatpants and flip flops. I mean, but, but be comfortable at night and give your hunting boots uh, a, a time to air out and dry out. Very important. Are the tsetse flies not a problem in the evening? Tetsy flies are attracted to moving objects mainly. Well, tetsy flies are attracted to anything they think they can get blood out of. So the problem with the damn tetsy fly is when you're riding the truck, which is needed to cover a lot of ground and pick up tracks, they will swarm behind the truck because they think it's a big, they think it's a big animal, right? It's movement and, 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 and they follow movement because movement is blood. Um, and then they start coming around and hammering, hammering you. I, I recommend that people carry a bug, a, a bug tamer suit, which has a pullover hood. Now that is, you may not use it at all on a safari. I have some people that are very sensitive to tetsy flies and they'll use it maybe once every other day, right? But when they're bad, they're really bad. And when they fly up your leg, you don't feel them. They start sucking blood and, and they'll leave you. Some people react bad to them and they get a welt. And what I don't need is a prolonged histamine reaction from a client that's been bitten two, 300 times. And then he swells up and then I have bigger problems. I don't, I don't need that. So a little bit of prevention, meaning your boots, your pants that cover your boots, uh, you know, having a long sleeve shirt where you can tie it down here, having a pair of gloves. I have some gloves over there. I'm going to show you what I like to in, in other equipment, but having, having the right equipment to cover yourself when needed from tetsy flies or sun, very, very important. Very, very important. Um, they can bite through blue jeans. I mean, the, 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 the things are amazing. Now, the, the, the other thing to a tetsy fly is once you stop moving, typically they stop bugging you, right? We stop the truck for buffalo tracks. We get off. Tetsy flies may swarm. They may not. We may be in an area that doesn't have any. They may be all over us. We get the backpacks. We head off after these buffalo. After five minutes of walking, no more. I mean, they just were, you know, even though we're moving, we're too small of a target that they dissipate. But that truck, that truck moving through grass and moving around Africa, those tetsy flies can be a real problem. So, all right. Um, I, I've got a follow on question for the boot. Yep. When I was in the service, um, it was not only the boot, right, but it was the sock you wore. Do you have any comments on socks? Yep. Those can be just as important as your boot. Uh, agreed. Uh, agreed. Agreed. A good pair of socks is worth its weight in gold out there. Um, I like uh, I like a, a thin high well thin I like thin smart wool merino wool. Once again, I don't sweat a lot, um, and I'll, I'll I have the sock that I like the best. It's called an Ascend brand. And let me grab it real quick, and I'll show you exactly what it is. Uh, stand by. All right, so here they are. Now, this was not um, – I didn't plan to have this, but I've got it on my uh, – they're, they're sitting on my table in my, in my, in my room there. These are a thin wool sock. Um, you get that thing. These are these are clean, and that's the brand name. If everybody, if you can see that, it's just a sin. You can buy them at Bass Pro Shops. Mm -hmm. They come in this gray color, 
and then they say there's a heavyweight one in a brown color. I've noticed no difference. They are not too thick of a sock. I like the longer top. This is a wool type material, so it doesn't smell bad. It, 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 I just think wool's better than cotton when it comes to sock, if you have the right kind of good wool. Um, and that's what they are. They're reinforced a little bit around the arch. You got some extra elastic. The toes are reinforced. If, I, if I'm getting that through, the toes are reinforced and the heel is reinforced. So they last a little bit longer than an average pair of, let's say, uh, hiker, hiker socks, right? Hikers and hunters, sometimes we go a little bit further than, than your average hiker goes. So I really like these, They're, um, and, or something similar to it. Th these are good. Okay. I, I would add to the, the, the sock thing in the fact that uh, I got uh, the socks that I wore um, they were merino wool, but they were actually designed for joggers. So if you go to a jogger uh, uh, jogging store, uh, mine I think are uh, smart wool, and they're made for uh, you know joggers. They're very thin, uh, but they've made it through uh, three different safaris. They're uh, they're wool, but they're incredibly comfortable. And I have uh, two pairs, and I basically wear one pair on one day and another pair another day, and uh, and if I think I might be getting a blister, um, I put a uh, polypropylene liner inside those socks. But both are very, very thin. But um, jogging, uh, jogging, wool jogging socks uh, are, are a really good, um, uh, good thing to wear if you're if you think you're going to be walking a long way. Um, and uh, I, the smart wool makes a good one, but I'm sure there's other ones as well. Yep, and, and I'd say what, you, what you're what you talking about is very similar to those uh, sin, um, and, and, and you're right, you're right. I, I, I like I like that wool blend. So, um, it, yeah, it, it, in Art, Art, you're exactly right. The socks, you can have a great pair of boots, and if you've got a crappy pair of, uh, of thin cotton socks, I mean, it just ain't going to work out. So, um, any other points on any other questions or points on boots, uh, boots or footwear? I mean, it, it, that one deserves all the time we can give it because you can't walk, you can't cover ground, you can't hunt hard. And, and we yeah, like to hunt hard. I agree. I, 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 I would say, you know, if you can't walk, you can't hunt. You need to wear a, a pants and underwear you don't chafe in. You know, because when you've got to cover distance and you start to chafe, you might get through day one. Day two gets a lot shorter. That's right. That's right. And, and on the clothing side of things, once again, comfortable, uh, comfortable, durable, and a little bit of extra space, right? Meaning that, like this shirt I have on now is not, it, it, it's fine, right? It's the right color. I mean, I see people bring khaki and their khaki looks about like this, right? It's white. Um, khaki, I want dirt brown or dark green, right? I want dirt brown or olive green. Um, but but like this shirt even is a little bit, I, I would, it's a little too tight here, meaning that give myself a little bit of room. What if a, if a tetsy fly lands and I've got a baggy pants or a little bit of a room, it can't bite through me. If I got a little bit of room in here, air gets through there and you cool off. You know, heat, de dehydration and, and heat stroke are a real concern when people overexert themselves. Um, you know, make sure, make sure that you broke a sweat in the pants, in the shirt, in the boots, in the socks, in the hat that you're going to bring to Africa. In fact, if they got sweat rings on them when you show up in camp, I'm a happy man. I'm a happy PH. All right. Um, I think you answered that one really well. Good deal. Good deal. I'm, uh, we're we're, we're going to be back to you shortly. <laughs> we'll be back around the we'll be back around the horn in a second.